It's always fascinating to experience the birth of a story that stands the test of time. As it survives and travels throughout the years, it's not uncommon to see many revisions and reinterpretations of stories that enthrall and entertain. After all, look at the myth of Hades and Persephone. What used to be a story about an evil god who stole an innocent daughter away from her loving mother and tricked her into being at his side for half the year, has evolved into the story of a mild-mannered loner and a beautiful maiden who conspired to elope under the nose of a smothering and petty parent. This often works as well as it does because of something the original story usually has, ambiguity. Whether ambiguity in the characters, world, or storylines, introducing a little bit of that unknown allows the audience to fill in the gaps themselves with their own experiences and allows them to be drawn into the world of the story even further. It's a reason why role-playing games who have blank slates for main characters inspire such connection and, interestingly, relatability. Yes, ambiguity in a story can be frustrating, especially when details appear to contradict. But in many cases, ambiguity, even ones that create contradictions, can light the fires of inspiration. For the reimaginer and interpreter, ambiguity is what allows new stories to be pulled from the old. By filling in the gaps of what hasn't been explained, or by suppressing one part of a story and exaggerating another, entirely new dynamics, morals, themes, and genres may be created from only one source material. In some cases, these reinterpretations can reveal the prevailing attitudes and values of the author and or culture, especially when you compare the different versions to each other. This phenomenon is readily apparent in comics. From the Silver Age to present day, some things stay the same. Superman, all-powerful, nary a physical struggle in sight, the man of tomorrow who can do anything. But some things change. The goofy hero who mostly lifted big things has become a conflicted moral exemplar of restraint and morality, more of a super symbol than Superman. Batman has always been a detective with gadgets who hides in a cave and solves mysteries, but what started as low-stakes comedy hijinks has become a story about the mantle of the Dark Knight of Vengeance. There is a clear shift from the action-based society of the mid-20th century to the symbols and values and philosophies of today. It used to be what they do. Now it is what they represent. Fascinating, isn't it? And it's not just heroes that are expanded upon via reinterpretation. It is also the villain, and often when done in this way, the villain may become the protagonist. One of the first prominent examples of this phenomenon in modern times is with The Wizard of Oz and Wicked. This stage musical takes the Wicked Witch of the West, an entertaining but ultimately one-dimensional villain, and expands on her character, taking the vagueness of the witch's origins and the ambiguity of the world of Oz, and crafting a whole new story from the pieces. In a skillful display of literary apologetics, the Wicked Witch of the West has transformed into Elphaba, a tragic figure whose path to being a pariah was set before she was even born. The more she tries to make good things happen, the more she tries to fight against cruelty, to defy gravity, the worse she makes things for herself and those around her, both those she loves and those she hates. All this culminates in her eventual philosophy, no good deed goes unpunished, so no good deed will I do. An entertaining twist on the story to be sure, but a question arises, what inspired this shift in perspective in Wizard of Oz? Was there a purpose to it? Was there a statement intended to be made about our world contained within the DNA of this musical? Did something in the surrounding culture or the author's life prompt this outlook? Or was it simply a fan project, a tribute from someone who enjoyed L. Frank Baum's work who put together his musings in an entertaining way? It's hard to say, so we must look elsewhere for this phenomenon of changes between different cultures influencing how a story is told. We do have one, and not only do we see it happening most often when it comes to the villain, but it shows how this shift can happen within a small time frame of 10 to 20 years. To see an example of this, we need look no further than the Disney live-action remakes. Gone are the classic Disney days of the ham sandwiches of delicious villainy, the figures in the dark who do evil, know their evil, and love every second of their evil. Disney villains are no longer evil because it's fun. They are no longer evil for evil's sake. Something had to have happened to them to force them onto their evil path. It seems that the runaway success of Wicked and Elphaba has inspired this theme of storytelling, where monsters are not born, they are created or perceived. Inherently, this is not a bad idea, nor is it a good one. It is merely creative. 
Trying to inject more humanity into monsters makes them merely different, not necessarily better or worse. Execution always matters. However, there are facts that cannot be denied in good faith. With these new villains, evil comes far less from within, and far more from without. Maleficent, the mistress of all evil who calls forth all the powers of hell, curses and toys with those who oppose her out of amusement and spite, was apparently a peace-loving fairy queen brought low by the ambitions of men who wished to conquer her and who took advantage of her kindness. She still acts with vengeance, but instead of being fueled by the twisted logic and alien morality one would see in an unseely fae, her vengeance is fueled by something very human, betrayal. Lady Tremaine's descent into the cruelty she inflicted daily onto Cinderella was triggered from a statement not meant for her ears. If Lady Tremaine had not heard these words being spoken, or had heard words more empathetic and compassionate, it could be argued that Lady Tremaine could have been kinder to Cinderella after the untimely death of the father. Had that external thing not happened, it can be argued she might not have been as bad. Another human trait, bitterness. Like in the novel, Shere Khan now had a clear reason to fear man and fire. Both had hurt him greatly. Man hurt him. Man hurt animals he knew. Man hurt the jungle. Man was dangerous. If Shere Khan did not act, this new man cub could do terrible things to everyone. Ironically, humanity was injected into Shere Khan as well. Xenophobia. The Beast, while not a villain per se, was certainly not a good person at the start. Spoiled, selfish, and unkind, the prince would leave an elderly woman out in the cold to die based merely on her haggard appearance. But he did not choose this personality in the remake, no. This outlook was forced on him by his cruel father who twisted him up to be like him and supplemented by the ones around him who enabled his behavior. More humanity injected. Trauma. Cruella's terrible nature was brought out by the Baroness. Jafar wishes to usurp Agrabah to attain vengeance against a neighboring kingdom. Notice a pattern. It was another, more evil character that caused the villain to act the way they do. Evil was often a response to other evils. In this way, evil is portrayed as something not inherent, but rather something passed along from one person to the next. While it can be rightly argued that this is not a wholly wrong assertion, this raises a very pertinent question. Where are the movies explaining how these characters became who they are? Was King Henry coerced or tricked into invading the Moors? What about the men who scarred Shere Khan physically and mentally? Did they have a good excuse for that? What made the Beast's father cruel? Why is the blame thrust upon their feet? If we are so interested in the reasons a villain becomes the way they are, why do these people not get the chance to explain themselves? Why does the buck stop with them? An easy answer is that it probably wouldn't make money, but what if that's a cop-out to distract from another truth? Is there another reason? Maybe the answer will be revealed if we look at more examples. After all, it's not only modern stories that get this treatment. All the way back to ancient Greece, the birthplace of Western civilization, this phenomenon is very apparent in the myth of Medusa. The titular Medusa was an acolyte of Athena, goddess of wisdom. As such, she would have sworn an oath of chastity in service to her goddess. So, it is highly unlikely she would have engaged in love-making with anyone. Even more unlikely that she wouldn't know such acts were forbidden. So, it is an obvious and egregious violation when she and Poseidon do make love. Athena, enraged at the desecration, punishes Medusa and curses her to be snake-like and dangerous. In the end, she merely becomes an obstacle for Perseus in his journey. The myth of Medusa is a skeleton from many different kinds of stories that have been made about her, and finding the true story is a feat near impossible. Ovid writes in Metamorphoses that Poseidon did the dirty with Medusa in the Temple of Athena, and despite what some armchair scholars might insist, the word choice does not make it fully clear whether or not she consented. But in the Theogony, written 750 years earlier, the story goes that they had copulated in a field of flowers with no details or implications at all about consent. Murking things up even further, there is evidence that Medusa originated in Libya and not Greece. But I digress, history is not my focus here, rather, it's art. If you are experienced with elements of literary analysis or have honed your storytelling instincts, when you look at the pieces that make up the myth of Medusa, then you can see many different ways one could write it depending on the story they wanted to tell. 
it likely has already been told on many occasions. And interestingly, what is most commonly accepted by culture as the real version of the myth has varied depending on the time and place, and each contains a different kind of Medusa, examples being the following. Medusa Eros, a story of star-crossed lovers who commit to each other, defying the rules set by society and overcoming any obstacle like horrible transformation because true love conquers all. Medusa Hamartia, a cautionary tale about a weak-willed or, in some cases, evil woman who compromised her beliefs and fell for the charms of a seductive tempter and was punished for her transgression. Medusa Tragos, a story of a poor, innocent woman who was violated, taken advantage of, and punished by amoral, hedonistic, haphazard, and hypocritical gods who care not what destruction they inflict with their vast power. There are more variations, but these seem to be the most common ones, at least where she is the focus character. If she is not, then she is often just written off as a one-dimensional villain or taciturn monster because the story of Perseus or someone else is what's being told at that moment. While all three of these versions of the myth of Medusa contradict each other, none of them contradict the source material. All versions are technically true, from a certain point of view. This is an example of what political fact-checkers may refer to as true, but misleading. It's how politically opposed news organizations can get away with completely different stories with the same sources and not technically lying, bringing focus to particular details while passing over others. In many ways, politics requires good storytelling instincts. In both politics and art, which version of the tale you tell merely depends on what you want or what the society of today wants. But again, I digress. Let's turn our focus back to art. So, what does society want? What is the most commonly accepted interpretation nowadays of the myth of Medusa? Interestingly, the story that many often favor for Medusa and Poseidon is not the romance of star-crossed lovers that has been placed on Hades and Persephone, nor the non-exemplar of a woman who was seduced by temptation, like various interpretations of Pandora. No, the favored story is one where Medusa was clearly and inarguably assaulted. The majority of the local consciousness prefers not Medusa Eros, rebel champion of love, nor Medusa Hamartia, the focal character of a cautionary tale. They prefer Medusa Tragos, where she is an innocent victim. A victim of Athena, Poseidon, and eventually Perseus, a blameless bystander brought low by selfish and egocentric gods, punished for a crime that was forced onto her and eventually killed to be a means to an end for someone else's story. A person who had no control over her circumstances was in the wrong place at the wrong time and suffered greatly for no good reason. You may be surprised as I am to hear that Medusa Tragos, the victim, is the version of the character our society has found the most inspiring. Often, this is because the part of the myth which deals with her death is changed or ignored entirely in favor of her being victorious over these external forces. With this, a new Medusa is born from the form of Medusa Tragos, the Medusa Nemesis. Over the years, this Medusa has become a symbol for the rage of those who feel put down and oppressed by forces beyond their control. Medusa Nemesis is an icon and rallying point to strike back with vengeance against powers that conspire to keep them down. Ironically, Medusa Nemesis is revered like the deities she wishes to bring down. Pay attention to that observation, it will become important later in this essay. Anyways, you may have observed that it's not just villains like Medusa that have the nemesis tag applied to them in this way. Even heroes are reinterpreted into a narrative of victimhood and fighting back against oppressive authorities or powers. And again, we can easily look to the most dominant producer of art in our modern culture for this phenomenon, Disney. In the original animated Beauty and the Beast, Belle is viewed by the townsfolk as the local eccentric. They have no problems with her reading books, they don't resent her at all, they simply comment on it being a little odd how much she reads and then go about their day. In the remake, these traits are exaggerated, starting a snowball effect of necessary changes. No longer viewed as an eccentric, Belle's a pariah. She's not treated with confusion, she's treated with scorn. Instead of a few outliers treating her identity and interests with disdain, and the majority being okay, the dynamic is reversed, and nearly the whole society she is in is against her. With these changes to the dynamics, we see the narrative, themes, and even the characters' core personalities change with them. 
Bell's independent nature is no longer merely an identifier, it becomes a catalyst. Bell no longer must be merely independent. In the remake, the story requires her to be ferociously independent, to fight back harder and harder against a society and people that continuously tries to keep her down. If this new Bell shows any sort of meekness or weakness, if she surrenders in any way, she loses. Even in any technical failures, she is still required to be a victor in some way. In the live-action Mulan, both the hero and villain get this treatment. Mulan's goal is much less about selflessly laying down her life to save her crippled elderly father. It becomes far more about showing how everyone else is wrong and humiliating the fools who dared underestimate their power. Both the villain and hero resent being held down by the views of the male authorities in the world and wish to break the chains of oppression placed on them. What separates them into hero and villain is merely being on opposite sides of the battlefield. We see where the priorities are for this new hero and villain. They desire the respect of the culture around them and are fighting to get it. A story of a hero versus a society. If that sounds familiar, it should. Indeed, these types of conflicts and narratives are nothing new. After all, the basic conflicts in a narrative can be summarized as man versus man, man versus self, and man versus forces. Each conflict can be thought of as a hero fighting a dragon. The dragon could be another person, the dragon could be a feeling or a characteristic within the hero, or the dragon could be a force of some kind, like nature or technology. Either way, the story often ends with the hero defeating the dragon. There are subsets to these conflicts, especially when you combine them, like a combination of man versus man and man versus forces. We get man versus society, or man versus authority. Judging from how stories have changed, this seems to be the type of conflict that people nowadays are most interested in. The story of a character who triumphs over the dragon of man-imposed forces that manifest as systems, traditions, rules, governments, cultures, and norms. A quest to defeat an authority in the natural or even the supernatural. Fahrenheit 451, 1984, The Handmaid's Tale, The Giver, To Kill a Mockingbird, The Hunger Games, Order of the Phoenix, Code Geass, Osura's Wrath. The authority the character resides in has been deemed unacceptable, and so embarks on the hero's journey to slay the dragon. In this case, slaying the dragon means to have the force in power either be changed or destroyed. Each tale of this sort of conflict, no matter how it is used, carries an implicit demand of the world. A demand that can often become very explicit. That those with power must be worthy of that power. If divinity has a part in the story, then often accompanying divinity is power. In the yesteryear, the role of the divine in stories has been commonly characterized as angry and spiteful. These divines would smite or curse you on a whim. But it is not that way today. As the years have gone by, and the idea of the divine being loving and merciful has become more enticing and pervaded our unconsciousness, we as a society have rejected the idea of an amoral divine as preferable, acceptable, or normal. In fact, we have come to desire all those who have power over us to behave responsibly with that power, and the more power one has, the more one is expected to exercise that power in an altruistic way. The more power one has, the more perfect one is expected to be. So, logically, when one has omnipotence, where they have all power that is possible, they are expected to be the greatest good that is possible. If one is all-powerful, then they must be all-good. According to the collective unconsciousness of our society, omnipotence demands perfection. They must go together, or not at all. Because, on the lesser scale, if the powerful cannot be trusted to use their vast ability to affect the world around them in the best way possible, if they are the servant who buried the talent entrusted to them instead of multiplying it, then what good are they? It is why dictatorships are feared and hated. Your dictator is given vast power, but are they worthy enough to have it and exercise it? History expresses the sordid reality. Nearly every single time, they are not. The old quote from Abraham Lincoln rings true. If you want to test a man's character, give him power. For instance, Superman is a good and moral person because he has to be. His vast universal level power brings with it universal level responsibilities and temptations. 
in some universes, in some reinterpretations often presented as a cautionary tale, Superman succumbs to those temptations and fails to make morally right choices. One time he even cast down the mantle because he realized that when he was tested, he could not make the right choice when it truly mattered. He could not be Superman. He was not worthy. And according to some literary apologists, such as Zack Snyder and his cinematic reinterpretation of the Man of Steel, being unworthy of power is acceptable, or at the very least, a tautology. It is asserted that heroes do not exist, or that if they do, they will inevitably fall. Not simply makes mistakes, they must fall. It is asserted that the world does not exist in black and white, or even lighter and darker shades of grey. Indeed, it exists in shades of grey, and even darker shades of grey. Those with power, who will inevitably use that power irresponsibly, and those without power, who will inevitably become victims of the powerful. So what if one disagrees with this idea, whether fully or partially? To reject Snyder's philosophy reveals an often obscure difficulty when musing on the subjects of power and responsibility. It is very easy to unintentionally communicate the message that victims are always to blame for their misfortune. Because, if we are to be honest with ourselves, the victim is not always to blame. We live in a world of chance and anarchy. Our grim reality has shown us that misfortune is frequently inflicted by circumstances beyond our control. Forces of nature indiscriminate in their destruction, and authorities who behave with selfishness or ignorance. Oftentimes there is no possible way to avoid all misfortune. It is possible to commit no mistakes and still lose. That is not weakness. That is life. It is not fair that Stephen Hawking's physical body deteriorated the way it did, but he still became one of the greatest contributors to the scientific world. It is not fair that Helen Keller was struck deaf and blind as an infant but her writings on politics and education still left a permanent impact on society. It is not fair that Gordon Ramsay was abused as a youth or when learning his trade, but he still created a culinary empire, saving not only businesses, but families and lives as well. It is not fair that Odysseus was repeatedly sabotaged by everything around him, but he still survived his journey home and became immortalized as one of the great Greek heroes. It is not fair that Bruce Wayne's loving parents were killed in front of him, but he still became Batman, the Dark Knight. It is not fair that Steam Rogers was born weak and eventually became a man out of time, but he still became Captain America, the First Avenger. The great men and women of history, and of fiction, as well as those who are not, are defined by one thing. How they deal with life's unfairness. All here became great and admired by so many because of how they chose to stand tall, move past their misfortune, and look to the future. And many villains would disagree with that notion. The Joker of the Killing Joke asserts we all lack agency, that anything people value or love is a meaningless joke by a monstrous, demented universe. We all need just one bad day, and our natures will inevitably turn to cruelty or madness. In the book of Job, Satan believed people were only righteous if their circumstances were favorable. He wished to prove that human nature contains a threshold, and when misfortune around him surpasses that limit, they would inevitably abandon their commitment to Yahweh. While Commissioner Gordon and Job have proven their respective villains wrong, we are still left with an alarming observation. The observation that a growing number of people seem to agree with the philosophies of the Prince of Crime and the Prince of Darkness. Whether we want to admit it or not, we are often cruel or uncharitable to our fellow man to cope with misfortune. Whether it's something petty like being a Karen to the receptionist because you're late to an appointment, or coping with a legitimate disadvantage like clinical depression by lashing out, this is part of human nature and should be fought. Unfortunately, it seems that some believe that cruelty in response to cruelty is not just permitted, but justified. You can and should be as nasty as you want to others if you suffered first. The shouted message is loud and clear. Anyone would do the same in my position. This is not only illogical as no group is a monolith, but it's frankly insulting to other people who suffer similar problems and make an honest effort to rise above the cruelty and misfortune they've been subjected to. It belittles any achievements they may have made as worthless, pointless, and wasteful. The most frightening observation is that of those who believe there is no point to trying to be a better person because everything is permitted in response to a perceived evil, 
Many of them are the largest contributors and controllers of our culture and entertainment. Oftentimes there is a pervasive feeling that this acceptance of that which is unfair, this type of acceptance on the part of the hero or the individual, is unacceptable. The default instinct is often to deny responsibility and insist on a lack of power or control to have been able to make right or good choices. We are often compelled by our nature to shift the entirety of the blame to another party. Once this is done and the stories we wish to reinterpret, we often see a shift of roles in the narrative. Heroes become villains, and villains become the heroes. The villain had been the good guy the whole time, you just saw the story from a biased or bigoted narrator. The facts were twisted up and you didn't have all the information or the wrong information or the information was presented to you in a misleading way. It's not the villain's fault they caused bad things to happen. It's someone else's. It's not Maleficent's fault. Two men's lust for power made her into this. It's not Shere Khan's fault. He is justifiably afraid of what man will do to everyone. It's not Cruella's fault. Another woman brought her horrible urges out. It's not Lady Tremaine's fault. A single line said at the wrong time made her like this. It's not Elphaba's fault. Other people twisted the truth. It's not the Onceler's fault. His family coerced him into destroying nature. It's not Medusa's fault. The gods were just picking on her. It's not my fault. The serpent tricked me. All the way back with Adam and Eve, neither accepted responsibility for their actions. The woman you gave to me is the reason Adam transgressed. The serpent deceived me is the reason Eve transgressed. Adam blamed Eve. Eve blamed the serpent. All of them could have chosen to follow Yahweh's one rule and not eat the fruit, but they did anyway. Passing the buck of blame has apparently been a part of human nature for as long as society has existed. And who can blame them for feeling this way? No one likes to feel responsible for wrongdoing or stare into the face of the reality that many of the problems of their life are of their own design. When held up to a mirror, we do not like to see the ugliness reflected in it. We are embarrassed when we realize we are naked. On the other hand, being able to shift the blame and establish yourself as a victim, to be able to indulge in self-pity guilt-free, to feel righteousness and justification as you fight against the evil empire, whatever its form happens to be, oh my, the feeling is just intoxicating, isn't it? No one wants to be the villain, not truly. Everyone wants to be the hero of their own story. But when others portray evil in a way that people can see themselves falling into, as a reminder to not go to that place, a warning to not get too close to the abyss lest you risk falling in. Alas, that idea has proven too icky to think about for some people. After all, look at Illumination and how they handle portraying the story and message of the Lorax. The creative process started off promising, seeing as how they created the song Biggering, which portrays the Onceler as he should always have been. An everyman who slowly descended into destructive villainy, whose pride and not his greed consumes him, whom all of us have the potential to become, and who is a critique on those who are already like him. The song was cut from the final story because it hit too close to home. Instead of the Onceler being fully aware of the destruction, yet having slowly lost the ability to care when his pride became more powerful than his compassion, the Onceler is now blinded and unaware of the harm he causes. The story is able to absolve the Onceler of part of his responsibility by pinning part of the blame on ignorance of his power and peer pressure from other, more evil people than he is. If the Onceler caused destruction solely by his own choices and tried to make excuses to himself to keep doing the harmful things he did, that says too much about the people like him and makes them feel bad about themselves and fear what they could become, or fear coming face to face with what they already are. To protect their high opinions of themselves, to protect their pride, Illumination divided up part of the responsibility for the decision to build the Thneed Empire to ignorance, peer pressure, and maybe a little greed, not enough to make anyone feel bad. Because when the Onceler is ignorant of the effects of his actions and merely caught up in success and too meek to resist pressure from friends and family, then the guilty don't have to come face to face with the clearest, undeniable condemnation of their actions. Giving the culpable quarter in this way creates a subtle, insidious excuse to ignore all their responsibility so they can say with a clear conscience, it's not my fault. 
Reality is, the impulse to insist it's not my fault is very prevalent in human consciousness. We all succumb to this view at some point. You often see parents who don't want to teach their kids consequences. It's easier to not teach them discipline, independence, and problem-solving skills. Instead, teaching them to exclusively depend on others and to complain and cry when things don't go their way. It's easier to say to the ones you love that it's not your fault, let me fix it for you, rather than own up and move forward. It's easier, no matter the situation, because the fear of being seen as callous and unempathetic, the temptation to not do what needs to be done, the path of least resistance, can be overwhelming. And because these types of parents are the consumers of stories, storytellers are forced to follow their demands to create the stories they want to hear. Like it or not, the tales of those who are victims are enticing and profitable. And what the consumers want has been made very clear. They want particular messages to be communicated ad nauseum. Bad things happened to me that I do not believe I deserved. I'm not to blame for my misfortune. It is someone else who must shoulder the responsibility. It is expected for my misfortune to have adversely affected me in some way. I suffered. Therefore, I deserve compensation. It's easy to misunderstand this point. On their own, these messages are neutral neither inherently good nor bad. Now, whether or not these messages are true, whether or not they are actually applicable to the nuances of a person's life, the demand for these messages to permeate the fiction of the present day is undeniably high. Is that a bad thing? Not always, considering there are many examples where these kinds of messages can be good. It is not Will Hunting's fault that he was abused as a child. No action he could have taken would have prevented it. And even if he did have the power to stop it, Will is not responsible for his bullies or his father's behavior. Therefore, telling Will repeatedly, it's not your fault, is absolutely warranted in this case, to the point of being a moral requirement. It can give courage and hope to those unfortunate enough to have suffered the way Will has suffered. However, what Will must take responsibility for is how he chooses to act in response to his trauma. His insistence that he not seek to change the disdainful, flippant, and violent ways he interacts with the people around him? That he is responsible for. That is his fault. We may not always have control over our circumstances or how we feel about them, but the one thing we all have power over is how we choose to act towards others. Unfortunately, many deny having this power, as well as the responsibility, and this rejection of reality is about as disappointing as the one we live in. Even worse, it can be exceedingly difficult to rebuke someone for this behavior. When such people are confronted for their cruelty, the most common response is some variation of the claim that, I do not have enough power, therefore I had no choice. Stretched far enough to its most morally bankrupt version, we get, I do not have enough power, therefore I cannot be cruel. Amusingly, people who say these sorts of things don't seem to realize that they inadvertently reveal that they are the exact types of people whom you should not entrust power to. Those who openly admit to being unable to display basic self-control and regard others with humanity no matter the situation reveal themselves as dangers to society. For someone cannot properly exercise and or acknowledge the ownership of the small power they do possess, the power to choose how one behaves towards others, that strongly indicates how such a person would act when they are given more power. They will often claim that they have been pushed to the brink and it's a desperate response, but how will they act when given more power and, inevitably, pushed to the brink again? In this broken world, such a moment is a guarantee. How can we possibly trust someone with large responsibilities and powers when that person demonstrates that they can barely handle the responsibility of simply being kind to your fellow man? If someone couldn't do what is expected of a functioning adult and keep the finite area of a house clean and maintained, would it be wise to give that person charge of handling a state? Of course not. Why should someone receive more power and responsibility when they can't even handle the little they already have? It is clear that strong caution must be exercised when creating stories with messages of absolution. While capable of doing great good, they are also equally capable of doing great harm. 
This is especially seen when numerous stories generated by modern artists relentlessly shout at their readers that they are victims of some kind. It can create an obsession with viewing all connections and stories through the lens of oppressors and victims, inevitably strengthening and feeding the insidious and attractive idea that not some, but all misfortune in their life is caused by something else other than them, and all actions are permitted in response to their misfortune. The normal themes and neutral statements from before become twisted into darker versions of themselves. Bad things happen to me that I do not believe I deserved. Therefore, I cannot be a bad person. I am never to blame for my misfortune. It, it is, is always someone, someone who must always shoulder the responsibility. It is expected for my misfortune to have adversely affected me in some way. Therefore, my cruelty and selfishness are excused. I suffered. Therefore, I deserve everything I want. These corrupted messages weave a shroud over our minds, where self-examination is lost, morality falls into the abyss, and society becomes little more than dragons who think they are heroes and fight each other in an endless conflict. Though, it seems that not all present fiction adheres to this, there are some stories which contain characters who insist their core conflict is man versus society, man versus man, or man versus nature, and another character reveals to them that the conflict is actually man versus self. You think you're entitled to everything just because you suffered, but suffering isn't enough! You can't just be strong, you have to be smart! You can't just be deserving, you have to be worthy! You are all the things that are wrong with you. It's not the alcohol, or the drugs, or any of the shitty things that happened to you in your career, or when you were a kid. It's you. I'm giving you exactly what you're always asking for, which is to be heard. But you don't have anything to say, because you don't know what you want. The messages that Watts, Todd, and Ian give are a clear condemnation and rebuttal to the prevailing theme in modern fiction. The world will not bend to our will merely because we suffered. You may only achieve outcomes you desire when you change yourself. You will not gain powers, benefits, or permissions without responsibilities tied to them. It is in our nature to desire benefits and powers, especially ones that society can give us without the responsibilities that are tied to them. Men often want the benefits of women's companionship, but often flee the responsibilities that come with it. Women often want the systemic cultural status of men, all of the benefits, but none of the responsibilities. We see this in fiction as well. Adam and Eve were granted permission, granted the power to live in paradise by Yahweh. The responsibility was not to eat one specific fruit. They were tempted by the serpent with the pride of being like Yahweh and succumbed. Little Nemo was granted airship to a kingdom and given a key to open any door. The responsibility was to not open one specific door with a dragon insignia. How appropriate. He was tempted by Flip with the greed of attaining knowledge and succumbed. Orpheus was granted power by Hades and Persephone to take Eurydice out of the underworld. The responsibility was to not take one specific action, to not look back before he had exited. He was tempted by his own fears and judgments of the god's character, an unusual form of wrath, and succumbed. The common thread is clear. Each had a responsibility with their power or privilege that they showed they ultimately could not live up to. They had one job and could not do it. They chose to succumb to temptation and had to face the consequences of their actions, and each elected to protect their pride and place all the blame on the temptation or the tempter, unknowingly succumbing to a second temptation. When we have done wrong, the temptation to respond, it's not my fault, is a dragon to be overcome. It is one of the many dragons we face each day. Temptations to abandon our responsibilities. Temptations to indulge in evil. Temptations to ignore the standards we are expected to abide by. Succumbing to these thoughts ultimately creates the mindset of, because I want it, I deserve it. However, temptation cannot make you do anything unless you surrender to it. The devil, the dragon of temptation, has no power other than what is given to him. He can't make a decision for someone. He can only suggest. He can't make someone do the one thing they were told not to do. He can't make someone abandon responsibility. So to hold the tempter fully responsible is, well, there's no better word for this. It's 
unfair. It is amusingly unfair to treat the devil like that, to respond to unfairness with more unfairness. When we insist the blame be on the outside force for all misfortune, especially temptation, we neglect to realize how we may have contributed to the situation being as bad as it is. And even in the cases when we do, often we still believe we do not have to take ownership because we only contributed to 10% of the problem. Mary Shelley's Frankenstein demonstrates this. So many tragedies occurred in the story because both Victor and Junior refused to accept responsibility for their actions. While it can be argued who shoulders a greater percentage of the blame in the situation, <coughs> Victor, <coughs> the fact remains that both were required to take ownership of their decisions, and both refused. Victor chose to create life, but abandoned the responsibility that came with it of properly raising what was the equivalent of a child. He also had the responsibility to tell the truth that something he created had murdered a family member. But he abandoned his duty and stayed silent to avoid consequences, and in doing so, let an innocent woman get executed. Junior did not have to kill William, Clerval, and Elizabeth, but chose to in order to feed his spite, to be consumed by self-pity, and to satisfy his vengeful feelings. Each felt that they were only 10% responsible for all the suffering in each other's lives, and it angered the other when neither would own up to the 90% that they felt the other was responsible for. When the reality is, each had a contribution to make in the tragedies that occurred. Each had a 10% to own up to, and didn't. The denial of the figurative 10% is a very powerful instinct. When we make unwise or foolish decisions, we do not wish to own up to them. For example, Darth Vader is an evil and dangerous man. This is apparent, or at least it should be. Vader constantly inflicts horrible suffering on those around him, especially if you fail or anger him. And no one, save the Emperor himself, possesses the power to stop Vader or bring him under control. If you are in the unfortunate circumstance of being forced to work for or around such a man, the wise thing to do would be to avoid provoking his wrath, and if possible, escape. This practical wisdom is lost on an admirer who naively gives her heart and obsesses over a fabricated relationship with a Darth Vader separate from reality and only exists in her fantasies. She wished for a world where she and Vader were together, taking vengeance on those she believed wronged her, to control the misfortune in her life and indulge in the drunken revelry of unlimited power. Notice that Vader's desires never factor into her fantasy. In a way, she fantasized about herself being in control of Vader. She chose to let this delusion consume her, to reject reality and substitute her own. In doing so, she chose to deny the clear and present dangers and, in the end, paid the price for her folly with her life. A clear and obvious cautionary tale about the dangers of parasocial relationships. There are many who believe that this woman was blameless in her actions, when it was showcased how obsessive behavior, narcissism, denying reality, blaming others for all your problems is unhealthy and dangerous, many people shifted the blame to the writer for the crime of having the audacity to put a mirror in front of them. The critics realized they were naked and sewed fig leaves together with attacks on others. It's obvious we love to deny the icky feelings of guilt, the denial of responsibility, the denial of our 10%, and let's not forget, the denial of very real flaws and evils within ourselves. Harley Quinn is a character that is related to, sympathized with, and in some cases morally admired by a good number of people, often because she is the victim of an evil and selfish person. But let's not forget she is far more than that. Remember, from the beginning, Harley had chosen to not be empathetic to the Joker's victims, instead choosing to idolize the, in her words, element of glamour that comes with being a supervillain. Not only that, it was Harley's choice to break her professional codes and get close to the Joker, a well-known unapologetically psychopathic murderer, and entrusted him with her heart to be emotionally vulnerable to an evil man like him. She ignored all warnings to lean into the abyss and fell. She played with fire and got burned. She danced with the devil and paid the price with her soul. Make no mistake, Harley is a victim of evil, but I implore that the fatal error not be made like so many have of believing that a victim vindicates all actions past, present, and future. This will be hard to hear and difficult to accept, but it is a truth that must be stated. 
Merely being a victim should not inherently make one admirable. Harley the villain is not a character to be morally admired, enjoyed, discussed, pitied, maybe in some nuanced cases appreciated, but not admired. What can and has made her worthy of being admirable is not who she is, but what she does. When she casts off the Joker, when she decides to become a hero with her actions rather than what has been acted upon her, when she accepts the responsibility of her choices and tries to change. Yes, the tortures and abuses of the Joker have damaged her. Every day is a difficult struggle where she battles the dark impulses that she gleefully embraced in the past. And due to the stark nature of trauma and abuse, it is a fight she doesn't always win. But Harley, the hero, doesn't have to be perfect. What has made Harley admirable, what has made her someone to aspire to be, is that in spite of the horrors that the world has thrown at her, despite the possibly permanent damage to her mind, despite all the pain and suffering she has inflicted on others in the past, she chooses to try and be better. She works to resist her temptations and keeps them under control so she can help make the world a better place, not just for the sake of her daughter, not just because she wants to distance herself from the Joker as much as possible, but because she is trying to do what is right. The irony is thick. In the world of injustice where one of the greatest heroes failed, took the path of least resistance, and abandoned responsibility to become a horrifying villain, in his place is put one who accepted theirs, committed to the small, narrow, and difficult path, and became a hero. The Joker poisoned both of the minds of Superman and Harley, but each responded differently in the end. Superman chose to project his status of being beyond healing, to blame another for all of his problems, and to wallow in the darkness, while Harley chose to take the hands reaching down to her and to pursue the light. That is worthy of admiration. With the way that the perspectives of our stories have changed, which conflicts and themes are desired points to a shift in our cultural thinking, where everyone's looking for and demanding a rescuer from all of our problems, that the surrounding world should change to suit our whims. Whether it's warranted or not, we are often casting out blame to external forces that have wronged us in some way, as if they owe us reparations for going against a contract or code they are expected to adhere to. And the more we do this, the more we strengthen a dark and alluring thought, to be absolved completely of any responsibility for our choices and actions. The enticing idea that the circumstances of our birth, how we were raised, how our parents treated us, or what school we went to, are the only things that determine our future. While it is undeniable that these factors can certainly help or hinder our fortunes or chances of success, surrendering to this idea that misfortune forces us onto a path that we cannot break away from ultimately becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Surrendering to this idea that misfortune forces us onto a path that we cannot break away from ultimately becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. We desire to change external forces, oftentimes begging for a separate outside force to come and do it for us. Our wish is to change the force of society in a way that the group no longer makes us, or those we care about, into victims. But the ones outside that group, the villains, the others, they hardly matter, for they are not victims. At least, by our standards. They are not victims of the system. Yet. And so the cycle repeats, creating another society where someone else can rebel. There is a temptation to let darkness consume us, and the dragon wins when we decide that making society better is less important than punishing a perceived wrong. When the driving forces behind our actions shift from compassion, justice, and love to self-pity, vengeance, and hate, the hero loses to, creates, or in some cases, becomes the new dragon and a new hero must step into the story to defeat the new dragon. The king is dead. Long live the king.